How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 50th video of the channel and today we're going to be doing another episode about recapping the shorts from this week. It feels quite amazing and more than a little shocking to already have 50 videos on the channel. Thank you so much everyone who's been watching from the beginning. For this video, we'll be looking at Alfred North Whitehead's concept of a subject superject, Melanie Klein's understanding of projective identification, and Kurt Levine's notion of a life space. Like always, I'll put the sources I've used for this video in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. Like much of Whitehead's jargon, the subject superject is rather difficult to pin down. He introduces it in process and reality without so much as a definition, seemingly expecting his readers and listeners to simply know what he's talking about. Nevertheless, there are some characteristics that seem to run through his use of the term. It holds a kind of objective immortality, functions as a result of an emergent unity, and is acted upon just as much as it itself acts. However, before we get into the particulars of what these elements mean, putting the subject superject in context first might be helpful. Essentially, Whitehead is first and foremost a process philosopher, meaning that he conceptualizes existence as made up of dynamic becomings, rather than static beings. For Whitehead, the world is made up of what he calls actual entities or occasions, basically things that are constantly in a state of change, rather than enduring as the same for any amount of time. All of these entities have a dual status, they're both a subject and a superject at the same time. To use this jargon for a moment, what this means is that, on the one hand, they subjectively preside over their own so-called immediacy of becoming, whilst on the other, they also exercise the function of their aforementioned objective immortality. To focus on the former first, this refers to the way in which they become concrete through integrating their own experiences in the present through a process he calls concrescence. The occasion essentially differentiates itself from others by forming a unity in its own right. However, White is careful to stress that this isn't all there is. Looking at immediacy alone, it may appear like there's some sort of being that simply comes into its own out of nowhere. It's here that subjectivity and its objective immortality come into play. The latter term refers to how things like emotions, once they fall out of view of immediacy of subjective experience, become objects that persist in the same way forevermore. Whilst this might not seem to tally with a process ontology at first, this is in fact fundamental to Whitehead's project. The superject acts as the embodiment of past becomings that allows for unity afforded by the subject to take shape and emerge. In this way, the subject superject acts subjectively and is acted on objectively. To borrow his words, it is fundamental to the metaphysical doctrine of a philosophy of organism that the notion of an actual entity as the unchanging subject of change is completely abandoned. Breaking down the barrier between subject and object even more completely, Whitehead goes on to say that the one side of a pairing can never exist independently from the other. Neither half of its description can for a moment be lost sight of. As he adds in the same section of process and reality, no one crosses the same river twice. What this means in the context of actual entities is that, paired with an objective immortality, they're always in a perpetual state of perishing. The influence of the past means that subjective immediacy is never experienced the same way from moment to moment. The superject conditions the subject as it were. In this way Whitehead describes them as having no real substance that persists, but rather a form that is primary and which enters into all sorts of different relations as time goes on. As a last little note on Whitehead and the subject superject, it would be a mistake to take from all of this that the one is more important than the other. He takes great pains to ensure that its system isn't deterministic in the sense that the superject completely controls the subject. Rather, it's a process of mutual emergence where, although the former calls the latter, the latter is also needed by the former for its own construction. This is why he uses the two words together, something we touched on just a little earlier. To end off the section, I'm very sorry if this all sounds a bit confusing. Whitehead is very difficult to summarize in bits and pieces. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. With this, I'd like to move on to the second concept we'll be looking at today. Melanie Klein's notion of projective identification. As I said in the short, this is a kind of fantasy where parts of the ego or interjected, let's say identified with objects, are split off and attributed to something or someone else. This is a process that is most apparent during the earliest stage of infantile development, particularly what Klein calls the paranoid schizoid position. In fact, the paranoid section of a name comes, at least partly, from a specific kind of projective identification that involves the mother's breast and the death drive what I'll refer to as Thanatos for the rest of this video. Essentially infants, from the moment they're born, experience Thanatos as the fear of death or annihilation. To deal with this pressure, 
they externalize it by splitting the breast, one of if not the first object they engage with, into a good and bad portion, the latter being associated with Thanatos. This provokes paranoia in the schizoid infant because it turns the bad breast into a persecutor. Now the fear of death is, for the most part, external, but the baby is still in contact with it. This is linked to what Klein describes as oral and anal sadism, acts of violence carried out on the mother's body through biting and excrement that aims to destroy the bad parts of the ego, identified projectively into her as an extension of the original object of the breast. However, this isn't to say that projection is solely a negative thing. Whilst in the paranoid schizoid position, individuals also have a tendency to identify the good breasts with good parts of themselves, a process described rather off-puttingly in notes on some schizoid mechanisms, with a discussion of excrement as a gift. Basically, the infant idealizes the good breast as something it can run away to when under the threat of a bad breast. To bolster its efforts, it projects split parts of its own ego into the breast, trying to turn it into some kind of perfect plentiful object capable of protecting it completely, sometimes converting the mother into an ego ideal, which the infant strives to emulate. For Klein, inspired by Freud, this dual operation of projective identification, redistributing both good and bad parts of a split ego, is characteristic of its narcissism found in schizoid object relations, basically the interpersonal relationships that the individual in the position undertakes. For the schizoid or schizophrenic patient, they love others insofar as they represent the good parts of themselves, hitting those who embody their bad qualities. In a sense, during the infantile phase of a position, the mother is essentially seen as an extension of a child, something that, if not successfully worked through, continues into their relationship with other people. Now, so far, we've only really looked at the role of projective identification as it relates to abnormal object relations, as are found in schizophrenia. However, Klein is careful to underline that the fantasy, both in its bad and good forms, is integral to normal development as well. The splitting off of negative parts of the ego both protects the infant and acts to create a template for aggressive object relations late in life. Likewise, the same thing but with its positive parts is instrumental in allowing the child to integrate their ego and stop it from falling into pieces, acting as a template for good object relations in the process. It's only dangerous when excessive. As a final note on projective identification, it is closely related to another, similar fantasy, what Klein after Freud terms introjection. This is basically its inverse, involving the schizoid infant internalizing and identifying with elements from external objects. For Klein, the two always act in tandem. To borrow her words, the projection of a predominantly hostile inner world, which is ruled by persecutory fears, leads to the introjection, a taking back, of a hostile external world. As she goes on to say in the same paper, the same thing happens the other way around. Introjecting a hostile external world leads to the projection of a likewise hostile internal one. It's on this that I'd like to move on to our last focus of today's video, Kurt Levine's life space. This concept was developed as a way to essentially think about psycho life as a kind of field and can be provisionally defined as the sum total of factors that influence a person's behavior at any given moment. As his famous equation states, B equals FPE. In other words, behavior is a function of a person and the environment, which together makes up the life space. To break this down, the diagram displayed here is an example of a person's psychological environment. This is made up of a myriad of different spaces or psychological objects, maybe the status of being unemployed, being an only child, a country of origin, and so on and so on. All of these are experienced subjectively, differing from person to person. It's not enough to just focus on their physical environment, instead you have to take into account all sorts of things, from interpersonal relationships to desires, ambitions, daydreams, etc. For Levine, all of these exert psychical forces onto the person, each being vectors with a certain magnitude, or importance, and direction. When it comes to working out what counts as part of life space, his guise that was real is what has effects. As such actual objective physical and social surroundings might not necessarily line up with what's real for the person. They may shape the life space, but at the end of the day, what matters most is their own way of perceiving it. Getting back to the notion of forces, this diagram represents a person, marked P, trying to reach a goal, G. Here, we can see how different parts of the environment affect the passage from one state to another. The person has to go through multiple distinct spaces before coming to achieve the goal in question, each pushing and dynamically influencing them as they move. In Levine's eyes, spatial characteristics are more than a mere metaphor. Instead, each cycle force field has specific relationships with those around them, like varying degrees of solidity, resistance, or permeability. It's important to remember that the life space is always in movement, 
the events and objects that make it up, are never static. Here, we find a fundamental difference between Levine's approach and that of Freud and the psychoanalysts. For him, behavior is dependent on the state of life space at any given moment, rather than on past traumas, which are only important in relation to how they're perceived in the present. To borrow his words, past events can only have a position in the historical causal chains whose interweavings create the present situation. Having now looked at all three shorts from this week, I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments, so I can do better. Next time we'll be either continuing our series on Proust and Signs, or doing a video on the relationship between gender and melancholia. Until then, bye!